So we finish, um, finish up the first part. So, um, so the second class of methods that are popular are Monte Carlo type methods. And of course, the ensemble karma filter ultimately belongs to that class. But we're not discussing it yet because it's uh, specialized um, to a particular problem. So I first want to mention two type of methods that um, work for all of these problems in a way. Uh, and some of them actually also being in occasionally proposed to be used in uh, data simulation, but they typically uh, don't quite work as, as such. Okay, so um, Monte Carlo methods, you basically, uh, you, uh, you produce samples from a certain distribution. And, and um, uh, ideally, you want to do it from the posterior directly. So if you have the likelihood, you have an explicit expression for the, for the prior, you have uh, also an expression for the, um, for the posterior, at least you have the, the cost functional associated to it. And so in principle, you have to distribute there. And then it's just a matter uh, of drawing samples from this, and that's not so trivial. But there's, of course, one method uh, which um, uh, can be applied to that problem is the mock of chain Monte Carlo. Who has heard about this? Just a few of you, okay. Um, so, but the idea is that you basically replace, um, it's, it's quadrature. I mean, after all, I mean, you, you, I hope most of you had some numeric analysis course. I mean, so you have, or calculus, right? So you have to integrate, you have to approximate integrals. I mean, how do you do this normally? So let's say uh, you have to approximate the area underneath, underneath this curve, and this would be the G. Um, then, uh, uh, of course, uh, this is the integral from A to B, G of X dx. Um, and uh, you can also think of this as an expectation value if you take the uniform measure over this interval AB. So, right, so you can think of there's an equal probability being in any values of A and B, so there's the density is sort of roughly speaking a constant. Uh, if the length of this interval is one, then that's, that's itself is a, is a density, otherwise you have to normalize. So this is in a way, it's an expectation value with respect to uniform measure on that interval. Um, so now what can you do to approximate this? Of course, um, a standard technique is to say, okay, I take, I can evaluate the function at these points, and I approximate it as um, uh, alpha one G at A plus alpha two at G at B. So I evaluate G at these two points and, uh, and then graphically the approximation you're doing is you fit a, a, a linear line through these two points and then you approximate the area um, by, under the curve by, by this is what under, is under the line here, right? So this is a quadrature rule. That's what's called a quadrature rule. But basically, you see there are two ingredients. There are these weights, which in this case are each, what value do they take? I mean, if you want to approximate an integral here, and let's say A and B is the interval length is one, then uh, what are the weights? How do you have to weight these two values here? Right, you, you want to approximate the area, sh the shaded area uh, given by this region here, right? So this line here connecting these two points, I have the function values at these two points at A and B at the, at the end points of my interval. How is the quadrature rule called and how does it work? Trapezoidal rule, yes. Uh, well, they're both equal, right? It's symmetric. They have to sum to one in this particular case, so they have to be equal at half each. Right? You just take the average. Yeah? The length of the interval is one here in this case. Yeah? So otherwise, of course, there would be a delta x, but the interval length is one. 
Um, so, um, and so basically, you, you have to choose these two points here, and I chose them, but you could choose any other two points here, right? You could have, I could have taken those. And then uh, to approximate an integral, I, an integral I approximate by a sum, and so I have to give them weights. And so the Monte Carlo method does the same thing, uh, it, it, except that these points are now randomly chosen. So for example, I would choose them from the uniform distribution on the interval a, b. I would ch randomly choose them, so I get two points, and, uh, and I give them weights, w, right? So these points here are my a and b in this picture, and this is my alpha 1, my alpha 2. And, uh, and there are some sort of limitations to this. Um, um, and uh, uh, so in this case, the M would be 2, and the W, actually the, the, the alpha corresponds, to be precise, the alpha corresponds to the W divided by M. And M in this particular case was 2, because I have two points. Um, and, and now you see if I, if I do my integral, So my approximation now looks like I approximate the expectation value of G by an integral over this new measure here. times the weights, times these Dirac delta functions. So there's still an integral, but that in integral I can immediately evaluate because I know if I ever have a Dirac delta, that just means that I replace z by zi wherever it appears. So this is exactly the same as um, 1 over m, the sum g, z i times w i. That's the exact integral, right? Because of the property that this Dirac delta has. And that looks like a quadrature rule now, right? So with this, so if I said m equal to 2 and z 1 would be a, z 2 equal to b, I'm back to the trapezoidal rule. So Monte Carlo is nothing else than generalizing this idea and saying I choose these points randomly and I give them some weights so that everything is consistent. And so the main thing is in, in, the, in the way I chose it here that these w's have to sum to one. Uh, to have to sum to n, sorry, because I normalize. All right? So it's just quadrature rules, random quadrature rules. Um, and so now the question is how you, and, and the, the thing is that these, um, um, these work in high dimensions provided the variance of G is, is independent of the dimension of your states, I mean of, the, of your uh, Z, right? And the convergence rate is relatively low, it's just square root of one over M. So it's less than first order. So uh, cl classical quadrature rules have at least first order, but classical quadrature rules don't work in high dimensions. Uh, you get just, I mean, you have to evaluate it over so many points, uh, it becomes unfeasible. Um, but these methods still work in high dimensions, but the convergence rate goes down, right? Markov chain produces sam equally sampled, uh, equally weighted samples, and important sampling uh, produces um, weighted samples. So let me just quickly go through the idea of Markov chain Monte Carlo because it's a, it's a very neat and simple idea. Everyone here in this room should at least know about it. So basically, okay, so do you know about the Markov chain? Who doesn't know about Markov chains? A few people don't know about Markov chain. Okay, so, so basically, uh, a Markov chain, the, 
the ingredient is that you, you, you assume you're in a certain position in, in space, and then you have a certain probability to go to another point. And that's a transition probability. It's a conditional distribution. So this here is a probability given that at a certain point in time, you're at, at a certain location. And so that allows you to basically um, uh, transform one distribution into another distribution. So you start with one distribution in Z, let's say P1. You apply this kernel, and I, I write it now classically here. And you integrate over Z, and that gives you a new distribution P2 in Z dash. Again, what you have here looks a bit like base, right? So you have a conditional, you have the distribution in Z, so this is actually a joint distribution in Z dash and Z. And then you integrate out the Z variable, so you're left with the marginal in Z dash. And that gives you a dynamic. So this gives you an iterative description how taking some distribution, you can turn that into yet another distribution. And the Markov chain on the column methods rely on the idea that, that uh, you can, that this transition has one distribution where it doesn't change. So this becomes stationary, fixed. All right, so you, you, you apply it to a certain density and you go through the procedure and the density afterwards looks exactly the same. So particles, I mean, you might have swapped positions also, but overall the distribution remains exactly the same. And Google rank, the Google rank algorithm relies on such concepts, right? Page, the page rank algorithm that you find such a distribution. So, so, so here now, in Markov chain Monte Carlo, the trick is that this is given. We know this distribution because that's our target distribution and posterior distribution. So the task is to find such a kernel that keeps that invariant. So it's like an inverse polynomial. Normally you have some sort of dynamics, so you have a Markov chain and then you try to find the invariant distribution. In Markov chain Monte Carlo, you do the reverse. So you, you know what you keep, want to keep invariant, but you don't know how the dynamics do, that fits the bill. But there's an easy way. Now, assuming you have such um, a transition kernel, so you have such a Markov process, then it's easy to sample from because basically you, you initially draw some random number somehow, and then the next step is you take that at some iteration index i, you've done it a few times, then this is a distribution you hopefully can sample from, and then you sample from this and that gives you the next sample. So you basically, you know in the Markov chain you've been there and then you randomly draw from all the possibilities where you can go according to the distribution you're given, and that gives you the next sample, you have that sample, and then you look again at all the possibilities to go from that point to the next step, and then it gives you a sequence of points, and if you do this long enough, they will draw, I mean, well, there are some assumptions to be made, additional assumption to this invariance principle. It has to converge to this, but let's not talk about this. So if everything goes well, then uh, you will draw samples from that distribution. And, um, but they correlate it, right? Because the new sample depends on the old sample. So there's correlation. And so, these samples are not independent, so the statistical quality is, uh, is reduced. So, for example, if the correlation would be uh, very high, then basically you can imagine that you don't learn much new things about the next, from the next sample about the mean because you stay very close to where you are already, let's say, if it's, uh, it's you know. Um, so, so there's a, an effective sample size, which uh, sort of, um, um, can be defined in terms of the correlation of these samples. But I just want to make you aware of this. So you, this is very easy to implement. You can actually, I will show you in a minute that you can turn 40 var immediately into a Markov chain Monte Carlo method. But it's expensive. You have to run it many, many times. Um, and the samples will be correlated. 
And so it will take a little time, but in principle, you can, if you have a 4D war scheme, you can do it. 